And why is it so urgent that we fulfill our mission as evangelists inside the church and outside the church? It's because of the consequences if we don't. Those who remain in spiritual darkness face the prospect of eternal separation from God. Now, I'm gonna give you one of my pet peeves. I have a real pet peeve about those words. Everybody says, well, you know, if you, if you're, if you die in your sin, you're gonna be eternally separated from God. Well, how do you think that sounds to someone who's never wanted to be around God anyways? They're like, huh, who cares? I haven't been around him now, why should I care? Why have we done that? I think that's because we have sugar-coated what it means to be eternally separated from God. We haven't told the truth. It's, with, that, with that term, we have a, it's a tendency to, it, to not fully explain what the implications are for those who die apart from Christ. Those who do not receive Christ as their Savior, death means everlasting punishment. Good morning. Today we are finishing up the book of Jude. We are in our last, our last, uh, uh, last sermon on the book of Jude. It's, and the book of Jude is a very powerful and convicting message. That remember, it came from the half brother of Jesus. He, his his father was Joseph, and his mother was Mary. Throughout our travels through this book over the last few weeks, we've encountered some very timeless truths uh, that resonate with, uh, with very much with relevance to our lives today. And if you've missed any of the sermons, please either go to our YouTube page or you can go to our, our website and the sermons are up there, except for last Sunday. I'm about a week behind, so I'm trying to get them uploaded. I should get both today's and last week's uploaded this week. So I want us to unpack this uh, final journey into this book of Jude, and wrap up the, the uh, profound implications for our walk, our daily walk with Christ. I want to begin by talking about the context. This letter was probably written between 60 and 80 AD, so probably either right before the um, temple was destroyed or after. Uh, this letter was written uh, with a, the idea of the great apostasy in mind. The great apostasy is a time when people will fall away, in the church will fall away from the faith. I would say that we are in the beginnings of it now if not pretty well knee-deep in it. The church age uh, that is, it was written, this was written to, it began on the day of Pentecost when the disciples received the Holy Spirit and began preaching, and 3,000 were added to the church that day, and the, the church age will end when Christ returns. And the great tribulation occurs. Jude writes to the church. He's telling them to contend for the faith. Not a word that we hear very often, contend. What does contend mean? Well, contend means to maintain or, or to assert the faith or to defend the faith. It's not just about maintaining. It's not just about keeping my faith so it's okay for me. It's asserting it, which means you, you go out, you share it. When somebody questions you, you share it. When somebody is doing something they shouldn't do, you assert the faith. We are to defend the faith we have in Christ and hold fast to the teachings of the apostles. This has been very important all throughout Jude. The teachings of the apostles. What did Christ teach the apostles and what are the apostles teaching the church? Because the problem is that there are a lot of false teachers out there. And there still are today. Contending is not going to be easy. Because it's one thing when we have to contend for the faith out there in the world, while the world is trying to, to convince us that we're wrong and that the Bible is not true and that all these things it tries to do to sway us. But the problem is, is that within the church, false teachers have entered. Within the church, there are people who are leading people away. They are tares among the wheat. We know the story, the parable that Jesus talks about, that there was a farmer a man who had a farm, and, and they planted the wheat, and, and then wheat and tares grew up. Wheat and weeds grew up together. And the workers come and say, Lord, do, do, we, do we tear out the weeds? He says, no, no, no. Let them grow together, because if you tear up the weeds, you may also tear up the wheat. And then at the end of the time, at harvest time, we'll gather them all, and we'll separate them. The tares will go to the fire, and the wheat will go to be stored. And the disciples are like, well, what does this mean? And they, later on, they ask him, what does this mean? And he says, well, <laughs> obviously, the, the Son of God, the, the, the Father, is the owner of the land. The wheat are the people, the believers, and the one who sows the tares is the evil one. 
And at the end of the age, the angels will come and they will harvest and separate the good from the evil. And the evil will be burned up in fire. It is no different today than it was in Jude's time. So let's finish up the book of Jude by looking at Jude verses 22 through 25. And Jude's going to give us some practical uh, implications, practical instructions on how to deal with various kinds of individuals in the church. Now, obviously, we know we're supposed to deal with people outside the church, too. And, and, and you know, we, well, we do that. We need, to be, we need to be patient. We need to be kind. We, but we also need to be assertive. But inside the church, these are people who claim to be Christian, and yet there's just not something quite right. Jude 22, here's what he says. He says, And have mercy on those who doubt. See, it's crucial for those of us who are believers in Christ, who want to follow God, we're waiting on God's, as we wait on God's mercy in the return of Christ, that we extend compassion and understanding to those who are doubting. Those who have questions, those who, who aren't firm in their faith. The term doubt here comes from the Greek word, which diachronim, <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to be able to say this right, diachronominus, diachronominus is what the word is. And this word means be hesitating or wavering. Now, we, some of us who have been believers for a long time, and, and we've, we're strong in our faith, and Believe me, I'm, I'm not including myself always in that area. We, we, may, we, may not, we may not remember what it was like to have doubts as we were young in our faith. And believe me, the world today wants, to, wants you to have doubts. Question everything. That's the motto. Question everything. So people in the church are doubting. There are those who are in a state of uncertainty or indecision regarding their faith and their belief. And now they may be struggling because of intellectual things. Uh, we, we went through, we were, we're not in it now, we're in the, the post-enlightenment age. We went through the age of enlightenment when science was king. We're starting to learn, especially in the last few years, that science may not know what it's talking about. It's interesting, one of the, one of the podcasts I watch usually is from Answers in Genesis. And they're like... You, the science is proving itself wrong. You know, we used to believe you go out to the Grand Canyon and you see all the layers of, of sediment. You're like, oh, they, they'll tell you, it took millions of years. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't until Mount, Mount St. Helens happened. Because when Mount St. Helens happened, all of a sudden they see the same layers being laid down in a very short period of time. What do they tell you? They tell you coal takes millions and billions of years to form, and it comes from the dinosaurs. No, it doesn't. It comes from plants, by the way. But now they have found places where it's been like six months, and the compression was so hot and so hard that they have coal already. So every time they say, every time the world tries to tell you something, to try to cause a little bit of doubt in your mind, there's, the truth comes out, and it's not there anymore. The doubt should be gone. But there's still people who doubt. They're wavering. They're uncertain. So they may be, be suffering because of intellectual challenges, or they have, may have personal struggles. There are a number of people that I've talked to, and I'm, they're like, well, I don't believe in God anymore. Really? Why not? Well, I prayed for this, and it didn't happen. Okay. Do you know why it didn't happen? Well, because God's not there. Well, maybe, maybe God just didn't want you to have it at that moment. Maybe it wouldn't have been good for you. Maybe it's going to happen soon or some other time. Maybe it wasn't the right thing. Or they've struggled, they've lost somebody, they've struggled in their lives, and they have doubts about their faith. And I, I, Numerous times I've been at funerals, and the people that I, that I know are strong, or have been strong in their faith most of their life, they've been to church most of their life, will sit there and say, yeah, I just... This makes me wonder, you know, what's going to happen to me? And I'm like, oh, well, let's talk. So they may have personal struggles. Or there could be external pressures. A lot of people, I'll be honest with you, some of the things I'm seeing in the world today, I think a lot of, there's a lot of problems in our, relationally in our world today, between men and women. And I think that's part of the reason why it's pushing... <laughs> 
I have to be careful how I say this because I don't want to have to edit all this. Let me just put it this way. It's causing, I think it's causing people of, on both sides, both men and women, to seek things that are not good for them, that are not righteous. Because society has created such a amount of conflict between the sexes. I had, an, I had an, an instance this week that I just discovered something that really broke my heart, and I'm struggling with it. Somebody I know. I'm like, you're kidding me. This person grew up in the church. They know. Why? And I'm thinking, well, that's why. There's this struggle between the sexes. Young men aren't... <laughs> there's not a lot of good young men. I've talked to a lot of young ladies in the 20s. There's not a lot of good young men around. There's not a lot of good young women around either, by the way. <laughs> so you have these external pressures that are on us. Our friends may influence us. Our families may influence us. How we were raised, but the, the pressures today of how can you believe that? Add to that all the pressures from, you know, the family struggles from 2020, what all that caused. So there's many different reasons why people may be in doubt and may be struggling. So how are we supposed to, what are we supposed to do here? And the doubt that Jude is probably stemming, talking about here, is stemming from the influence of false teachers in the church who are very sly. It's just, it's just a slight change that they make. But it creates doubt and adding, spreading deceptive doctrines. These false teachers, they're sowing seeds of confusion. Remember, in Titus, Paul tells Titus, you need to confront, excuse me, you need to confront these leaders because they're causing divisions in the families, because the churches were in the, in the homes. But they're causing divisions and, and problems within the church. Sowing seeds of confusion, causing people to question what was taught by the apostles. That's why I always tell, I, I just recently I had somebody online ask me a question and uh, it, was about, it was about whether or not he, he should make a movie with a woman with a bikini in it. On, in it. Well, what does the Bible say about that? Look that up in a concordance to see if you can find bikini in the concordance. It ain't there. So I had to think, what, what does the Bible say about this? Well, obvious one to think on these things, whatever is holy, whatever is pure, whatever is righteous. You know, don't cause a brother to stumble. Are you putting something on a screen causing someone to stumble? You know, the Bible has the answers. If we go back to what it says, what it says in its original context, what the original authors said. And what should our attitude be towards these people? Because believe me, when you're teaching somebody, it can be extremely frustrating when they just keep denying it and denying it and denying it. I have some, that's someone online that no matter what I said, it wouldn't matter. So I just gave up. And I said, I'm praying for you. You have it. want to talk about this some more some other time? Let me know. And I just dropped it because I was so frustrated. I was causing stress on myself. But our attitude needs to be an attitude of mercy. Jude tells us, have mercy on those who doubt. 